the funny thing is podcast. I'm your host, Nicole Birch, where every week I bring on somebody who shares their traumatic life event, the medicine they took to heal, and the funniest thing they learned along the way. And today is no exception. Today I have my very good friend with me, Nanor Avedisian. Welcome, 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 welcome. Thank you, thank you. Yep. I'm so glad to be here. Good. How are you doing? Oh, it's wonderful. Good. Um, just excited to share some stories and, Great. and see, you know. Good. See how we go. It's so I was it. like, I always like to say how we met. So we met at the Groundlings probably 12 years ago. Yes. Right. So you were in charge head of marketing. Is that uh, what was your whole box position? Box office marketing, social media. Yes. Yeah. And then I was just a, what do you call it? 101 student just when we first the met and then we became really good friends. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I've been doing it ever since. And then there was a story you told me a couple months ago that I was like, I've known you for over a decade and I had no idea. So what is a life-changing event that changed your life? Well, uh, it was 1990 um, when uh, Iraq or Saddam Hussein basically took over and invaded Kuwait. Basically Desert Storm, Gulf, uh, yeah. you know, the Gulf, the Gulf uh, War. War that had happened, but we were there during the occupation time. You lived in Kuwait. So I was born and raised in Kuwait, okay. yes. And, and the day, August 2nd, 1990, is the day that very much is in my brain all because that was the day that we were going to come to the U.S. for a vacation. Okay. And we are all excited. At 6 in the morning, we take off to the airport, oh and, God. you know, all's fine and dandy. And then we, as we approach the airport, airport's closed. And there's one soldier standing there. Mind you, there are, the Kuwait does not have an army. Yeah. We've never seen a soldier out and about, barely see any cops. That's interesting because I'm thinking from my perspective, I would have thought that that's what Kuwait was, just based on my American brain and all the things. Like, what was Kuwait like before all of this? Oh, before it's anything? like, a, it's just like little America, just everybody speaks Arabic. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. You still had all your fast foods and this and that. Yeah. Like it, it was a very much the most like, it, it isn't anything different than living here pretty much. Like you in know? LA. It's, in that's LA. That's a relative city. Absolutely. Okay. Or I would say Miami. Everybody's driving these hot cars. Everybody's, you know, yeah. rich and yeah. whatnot. So, yeah. Um, so we get to the Arab and there's this one soldier's like, Yalla, yalla, go back, go back. It's like, what the hell? We have a yes. flight. It's like, no, 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 airport's closed. Just go back. Confused. Yeah. Turn on the radio, this and that. Nothing. Radio silence everywhere. Oh, no. We have no idea what's going on. And as we're driving down the freeway, there's a tank coming the opposite end with an Iraqi like uh, flag on it. My mom's like, what? Dad is like, everybody's confused, right? It's just you three in the car, mom, dad, uh, and you. Well, our uncle was taking us to the airport oh, got so, it. to okay. drop us off. Okay. And so coming back, we're like, what is going on? And then it turns out Saddam just took over from 2 a.m. Uh, 2 in the morning till then Saddam just walked into Kuwait and took over. So we lived under the occupation for three more months because, you know, how by the time America came in and did yeah. all what they did. So during that three months, every day was like, well, we got to go stand in line for some bread and then, but checkpoints everywhere. And, uh, oh, now today you need this paperwork. Oh, tomorrow you need that paperwork. You can't leave before you do that. It was just a mess. For three months. For three months. So, so wait, 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 I just got a question. Okay. Yeah. So your uncle is driving you. You guys realize that Iraq is taking over. And then what, you drive back to your uncle's house, to your house? No, to our house. And okay. Yeah, to our house. And because, uh, you know, we get dropped off. My uncle's just chilling with us to see what's going on. Yeah. Trying to get, you know, the radio going. Because even in Kuwait, you'll get, like, Monte Carlo Channel, which is, like, the foreign okay. uh, European, like, radio stations, whatever. So you're able to catch something or another. That's how we found out Iraq had taken <sighs> over, basically, without a bullet fired. All, all really? All. Yep. And so it was just like a crazy time where it's like, Kuwait? And like, you were held at this time? I was 12 at this, yeah, at this time I was Insane. 12. And it's just one of those like, and we had a green card and everything at the time, so we yeah. bounced around U.S. every year or so. And it's just, it was like, it, 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 overnight your entire life, life has turned yeah. and you're forced into it. So finally, and as the days are closed, oh, sorry. Sorry, in that three months where mm -hmm. you were allowed to stay in your house, they didn't like move yeah, yeah, you yeah. to, okay, no, no, okay, no, no, okay, no. okay. You okay. stay in your house, uh, neighbors robbing neighbors, because it's like the hottest month in Kuwait, nobody's around. It's, I'm t it goes up to 140 degrees. It's no joke. So no one stays in, in Kuwait. Everybody leaves during summertime. 
So everybody and now you knew their have vacation. And it's August. Yes, August. Everybody's out on vacations. They weren't able to come back to their homes. So the neighbors, knowing full well their neighbors are out, robbed them. It was oh, crazy. crazy. But um, it wasn't anything particularly violent towards the regular population. But Kuwaiti guys started rebelling here and there. And that at the checkpoints, there were some dramas. Yeah. So I remember the very first incident of like, we were downstairs playing uh, like soccer with the kids, the, yeah. you know, and uh, this car just like a Mercedes just comes around the corner. Another car right behind it. They somehow lock him in. These uh, Iraqi soldiers come out. And I don't think I've ever told you this. The Iraqi soldiers come out, grab the guy out of the out of the uh, driver's seat with like the guns and everything, and they just attack him, and we ran. I was like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god! So I ran up to the thing, and I'm looking through the window. They just packed the guy up in the car and just left. But they were like point blank executing Kuwaiti guys. It was crazy. That's so, yeah, insane. So and you guys were just playing soccer. We were just playing downstairs. But uh, the second one was um, we were at a checkpoint and my mom, we would go get bread, right? On the way back, my mom would give some of the bread to the guys or the soldiers standing at checkpoints. Yeah. So we're heading this way, standing on a checkpoint. This coming way, there's a checkpoint. And at that checkpoint, some car, I guess, with Kuwaiti guys in there come up, but they don't stop. They bolt. These guys pop out. A, um, the Kuwaitis or the Iraqis? The Iraqis. Okay. The soldiers okay. uh, take out like uh, an Uzi uh, or what is bazooka that? Or, uh, bazooka. Yeah, bazooka. Okay. And just shoot. And these guys like divert and it doesn't hit them, but they get away. And that was one of, you know, the other violent moment where I was like, oh. Shit's getting real. You saw a bazooka so, getting shot? You can cuss. Well, okay. Yeah. Oh, this yeah. is definitely a fuck off moment. Yeah. 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 And so that was like the second. But then my dad basically, as the days were approaching where United States were like, no, we got to go in there. We're going to go in there. We're going to go in there. All my other relatives were like, nah, there's not going to be a war breaking out. Nah. My dad's like, they're not going to let Saddam just take over one of the richest oil countries in the world. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. They're going to take over. And so my dad had that in little intuition, and he was like, we got to go. So the day we left Kuwait was the day before United States hit, actual strike day. And we packed up all our stuff in a big truck. We, my, we hired a couple of guys for, like, a big, you know, truck piled up everything in there and my dad had a little Mazda Stanza little hatchback okay. okay so me my mom my dad and these two guys you know with the truck so we hit the road and because the borders are locked because it's wartime and all that it's locked to, for a shortcut to get to Syria yeah because we were trying to get to Syria so now where is okay logistically I know Kuwait is between what Iraq and Saudi Arabia well, Saudi Arabia is big, huge in the middle. Right. I imagine Russia is like right, the right, middle, right, big right. one. But Kuwait is actually bordered. Yes, it does have a border with Saudi Arabia, but it's on the Gulf. It's three so sides right. surrounded by water. Okay. Uh, Bahrain and, and Qatar and all that are closer. Okay. But on top of it is Iraq. And then next to Iraq, on this side, it's like Syria, but then there's Jordan right there too. Okay. Got it. But Iraq and Syria, had a, they have a border, but they shut down that border. So we had to go through Iraq, then hit Jordan, then hit into Syria. And you had to go through Iraq. Through Iraq. Spend a night in Baghdad. For sure. Okay. The night before the strike, I was in Baghdad, like in the middle. What? <laughs> It's this crazy. is insane yeah. to me. Okay. So I was like, how is it that we're trying to escape, but we're in the middle, the middle of the, of the den. country <laughs> where everything's <laughs> happening? Middle of the lion's den. And it is desert. Like desert. Yeah. It's the water supply or this. Oh, and, and then the you, gas hit, and like... you hit Iraq. Uh, they've never tasted, the regular population has never tasted fresh water. They don't know fresh water. We saw, like, I saw a, a, a water fountain. I was like, oh, man, you know, drink some water. And it was salty. It was salt, salt water. Salt water. And there's this one dude that helped us, and all he wanted was, like, a bottle fresh, of fresh, fresh water. water. That's all I, he asked for. How do they even survive without fresh water? That's weird. I have no idea. Okay. But, you know, and Iraq sits in a very prosperous, like, two river situations. Whatever. 
Okay. So we go through Iraq, but going through Iraq, and right before we hit Jordan, now everybody knows that everybody's trying to escape Kuwait. Yeah. And as you're escaping Kuwait, you have all your stuff with you, right? And all your valuables and yeah, whatnot. Yeah, and you have a big truck, yeah. And, you know, uh, so they just, whether you have a big truck or not, you're still carrying, you yeah. know, and Middle Easterns love their jewelry, right? So yeah. it's packed up in a little thing. Right. So, uh, as we're going through the desert, it was in the middle of the night. We had left Baghdad and heading towards Jordan at this point. And How many days travel is it from your home to Syria? Uh, through that route, it took three nights. Okay. On the fourth day, we got there. Okay. Um, and So you left Baghdad. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, we left Baghdad. It's obviously through the desert at night. And uh, in Baghdad, they don't really... Um, they didn't really have that organized of, like, everybody travels in, like you know, bunches, what do they call them? Con like convoys. caravans. Yeah. Okay, you can, oh, yeah. caravans. caravans. There yeah. you go. Yeah. So you basically don't have that option. You're just on your own. And so going through that desert in the middle of the night, it was like three in the morning. I was sleeping in the back of the car and suddenly just car shakes and commotion and this and that. And I just like wake up and you're, it's one of those like, where am I? What century am I? What's going right. on? Right. You know, you wake up, what, what's happening? Commotion. And then you know, I just see car on from this side, car from that side, and everybody's like yelling, screaming at each other. My dad's keeping it cool, just like heading his way, but uh, they were basically desert pirates. They yeah. were trying to pull us over, rob us, you know, God knows, probably die right out there in yeah. that desert. So uh, it was it was weird and cool and like in a way where it's like, what is happening? And then they had no idea that the truck behind us was with us. Yeah. So the truck behind us, the dudes just went, I saw the guy, one of the, the passenger side guy just bust out a shotgun and just keep shooting at these cars. It was like... <laughs> It was like a scene from a movie. Oh I swear. my god! So just and you're just in the okay. I'm in the car. Okay. I'm like just a lot of you know lights and headlights and you know yeah. darkness and so you're like what is happening and then you know you divert too much you go into a ditch of like sand so you're literally like you you set yourself in a stone in yeah. a situation like that where you're stuck they can do whatever. So these guys came up with guns and stuff and start shooting at them. One of them actually flipped right into the into the desert, like into the sand and off the freeway, like lost control. The other one went also like eventually was trying the to tire. Off. He shot the tire out. That's what I so say every done. time I watch a movie. I'm like shoot, shoot the, the tire. <laughs> <laughs> It works. Part. It really does. It does. I know. I've seen it firsthand. <laughs> That's insane. So, you know, he shot the tire out and it just pew, right over flip and, and took a dive. Yeah. And we just like, and don't wait around, just coast, coast through. And then we get to finally to the border. That's where we just kind of like, what just happened? And at the border, they were like, no, you can't leave until in the morning. We got to make sure everybody's together and safe. I was like, okay, now I understand why they were going to yeah. try to do that. Yes, please, let's all do that. So that was the moment where, you know, in a blink of an eye, you don't think of certain things that would ever occupy in, you know, like desert pirates all of yeah. a sudden. <laughs> so it's... it's you this know, is a book. This, this is a movie. <laughs> like, you need to do it from the 12-year-old's perspective because that's nuts, dude. It's crazy. Like, in, in the middle of it, though, like... I don't know. In the middle, you have no time to think, panic, none of that. Like, yeah. that's what I noticed. I didn't, it was, I didn't really panic. I was more taking everything in and, like, my brain was slowing it down, you know, like, to yeah. take all that trauma in. <laughs> yeah. So. And I, I can't, like, I've met both of your parents. I can't picture either one of them losing it. Like, they both, uh, your dad seems pretty, like, even killed. Yeah. But, He's, like, in that situation... It's, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, it, there's a benefit to that as well, which, you know, if you, if I had a hot head for, for a dad or the it, dad it that like gone very differently, exactly. Yeah. It could have actually gone worse than because you're hot head. You think you got this and you're going to yeah, do something. Yeah, if it was you, you if it was you driving, it could have gotten a lot worse because you're hot head. <laughs> totally. I'd be like, mm, taking you out, taking you out. But yeah, I mean, you know, I think about these, you know, dads or guys that are, you know, always carry guns around and this yeah. and that. But like, 
yeah, you carry the gun. I'm not opposed to any of that, but it's just you carry it around, but you have no idea if you're going to de-escalate or escalate the situation. Yeah. Or you and your little hot-headedness and ego think that, no, no, I got this. It'd make it worse, yeah. Yeah. So it was just, it was a very eye-opening experience as far as like, ah, there's these stuff going on yeah. all around the world. So then you get into Syria. We get to Syria. We had already an apartment there, but it was always empty. We never lived there. Before and all this happened. Before you had all one. this. Okay. Yeah, we had it a while ago, but we never had used it. Right. So it came in handy, brought in all our, you know, uh, stuff and put it there. We still have a fully furnished apartment there with now a few bullet holes in there. Insane. <laughs> After all the Syria problems. And so, then what, so like, what was, what was Syria like before everything oh, recently? My God. It's my favorite place. Is it really? It's my favorite. Oh, I would walk down I'm the I'm such street. a dumb blonde American right now because this is amazing to me. Yeah, I, freedom concept. You really did have it in Syria. Really? You really did. I would walk down the street at 2, 3 in the morning. There's nobody could mess with me. Yeah. I couldn't even walk across the street from Groundlings without a buddy. Yeah, on Melrose. On Melrose in Hollywood, you're like, I need somebody. This isn't freedom. <laughs> exactly. How many people we know got held up there? Yeah, yeah, nobody would mess with you. You had religious freedom. You had your cultural freedom. What was, your, um, I was, was talking about this with um, one of our guys a minute ago. What was attire for women? Anything you want. In both Syria and yeah, Kuwait? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, some of the hottest and craziest bikinis I've seen <laughs> outside really? of Miami. I saw, like, pictures been... of, like, Kuwait, like, back in, I think, the 70s or something. They're wearing, like, miniskirts oh, and da-da-da. Yeah. And then, but now it's not that way. No, no, it is. It, it still is. is. It still is. It okay. still is. But it's just uh, due to all these... Um, politics and stuff. Politics and whatnot. Uh, they've kind of gotten a bit more conservative. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean that... You're in a full yeah, head no, to no, toe. No, 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 okay, no. Okay. Never was. Okay. Never was. Great. A dry country, you're not, like, you can't drink. There's no bars. Okay. Plenty of drinks in the black market. Right. And the fact that the emir or the prince of the of Kuwait is actually um, half owner or part owner of Johnny Walker. That's so... hilarious, dude. <laughs> so why would I want to sell $30 bottles when I could actually put it on the black market and sell it up for 250 bucks? Oh, yeah. Even though they have all the money in the world. But That's crazy. Yeah, so it's a dry country now, but it's not anything really different okay. than, you know, you can wear whatever you want. You can okay. go to the beach, wear bikinis, whatever, no problem. Is Syria dry also? No, no, no. 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 Syria's Again, full, freedom, all of full it. Again, freedom, full okay. freedom. Oh, my God. They have the best beers and everything's beautiful. They have... It, from nature to whatever. It's they speak Arabic been, as yes. well? Okay, okay. Uh, they speak Arabic and they're, they're Damascus, Aleppo. Aleppo is the city that I was staying at. But Damascus is the oldest city in the world. Yeah. So Aleppo being second, like it's so much history, so much culture. Yeah. It's just so. Like, like you think, oh, like when people are like, oh, I love going to London for the history. And mm -hmm. you're like, no, 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 no. We got <laughs> you gotta... beat. We got you beat. Okay. Yeah. The fortresses and this and that. It's just, you know, all that withstood all these history. And now, oh, civil war. It wasn't civil war. It was a takeover, basically. Yeah. So, yeah. Everybody was happy in Syria, but that's, that's, I really loved Syria. I didn't like the idea of coming here. Too that's what much. I was going to ask you. What was your <laughs> thought? Because I know you said you were getting ready to go visit the U.S. Where were you guys ready? What city? Uh, LA. LA? LA. Okay. Did yeah. you have family here? Yeah. Uh, my dad has cousins and stuff here. Okay. And uh, we also have done uh, Maryland as well because my uncles are also in Maryland. So okay. we bounced here and there. Coast. Okay. Yeah. And so how long were you in Syria after in uh, the apartment? Almost two years. Okay. And then moved to Bay Area, San Francisco in 92. And was there even an option for you to move back to Kuwait? No. It was no, no, no. Gone. It okay. was done. Yeah. Uh, I, I, like, my dad never even looked back. My mom never. There's no future. Sooner, that's yeah. why we had the green card and everything, because there's no future. There's no uh, nice higher education for non-rich people. Yeah. You know, so you had to leave at one point To or pursue another. anything bigger. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, uh, got to... San Francisco, I started at 10th grade when I got in. I finished 9th grade in Syria. Do you already speak English? Oh, yeah. Okay, Kuwait great. was very solid, with a British accent. Might as well. 
That is amazing. Yeah, Kuwait had British English, so my humors always had U in it. Yeah, favorite color, all that with a U. Oh my gosh. Um. So yeah, I had the British accent, so I get, got into the to the high school. I didn't know that that was their cute way of like flirting and whatever. Yeah. But, but they would make fun of my accent and be like, "Okay, fine. I'm not gonna talk. I'm gonna watch Saved by the Bell, and I'm gonna get rid of this. I'm gonna watch <laughs> Saved by the Bell." <laughs> I'm going to get rid of this, but uh, hey, you know what? Save Out of Hell totally gave me a Save little you. bit Zach of Morris. insight, Zach right? Morris. Oh, Who's my God. My first crush. No. Yeah. It's um, everybody's, yeah. But that's how. And then once I finished high school, I got into L.A. in 96. We all moved to L.A., and it was just a better choice. It okay. It was seclusion, and Bay Area wasn't the lifestyle. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you guys have been here ever since? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Glendale. <laughs> Glendale. Love it. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, what was I going to ask? Okay, so what through all of that, which is like I, my brain's trying to wrap myself around it because I'm like, oh, when you were going through war torn country and like in the lion's den, I like had my period. And like, I feel like those are basically the same stories, right? <laughs> of course. Um, how did you cope with that? Or like, have you noticed residual stuff from that in throughout your life? And how did you cope? What medicine? Oh, absolutely. Like, um, you go. The coping mechanism, to be honest, there was no time to think. There was no time to do anything. As a 12-year-old bouncing from one country to another, getting into a brand new school, trying to make things work. And by the time I got to the school, it was already halfway point at an eighth grade. Yeah. So I had to get into eighth grade and catch up. Yeah. And on top of it, at ninth grade, you have this big, huge government examination test yeah. that if you don't pass, or not that you don't pass, at a certain level you they will divide you up based on your score whether or not you're going to go into literary or science oh that was in syria yes okay yeah, yeah. but if you get a certain point and above you get to choose whatever you want to do okay but that's at a ninth grade but we've never had any that like in any kuwait that. or anywhere yeah. and the level of education in syria far superior to yeah. what kuwait was right and so their english the in kuwait english was a lot better than syria right. because syria was under more french colonization for you know throughout and Kuwait was under English colonization. Right. So, um, so I needed time to catch up. I needed time to like handle this. Yeah. So there was no time to be like, Oh, I went through a trauma. Oh, what do I do? Yeah. Oh, no, I had to jump in, make friends, get, catch up with the, everything. There was three brand new subjects that I've never even heard of before. Yeah. And it was like, Oh my God. But if you don't pass one of them at all, you don't pass the entire grade. Right. Yeah. It was just so frustrating. <laughs> And so I didn't have time for any of it. So I learned that you can just, whatever you're going through, if you just throw yourself at something yeah, and just power through, yeah, power through yeah. with work or this or that, then, you know, that will be just, you know, I mean, gone. it literally has a keep your head down and keep going mentality. Exactly. Like from like the war part of it to like, just keep trying yeah. to survive as a teenager. I feel like at that age, if I had not, been put in a situation where I needed to just catch up and do and do, like I have no time to think. I think it may have had left me traces of trauma more yeah. so than me sitting here laughing about these yeah. things, you know, because it was like, well, it happened, but I didn't even get to dwell on it. Yeah. So I had to pull forward because yeah. I had no choice. So what I learned from that is, is basically anytime I'm against something or facing something. Yeah. Put myself into work. The action speaks louder than anything else. And you do else. do that. I do. You do. Whenever it's like a stressful situation, but then you yeah. do stuff, like even with like the candles and stuff, everything mm -hmm. like you've done. She makes these luxury candles, by the way. But every time she does something, like you put your nose to the grindstone and it is, you yeah. come up with something brilliant. And I'm like, <laughs> what am I looking at? And I'm like, oh, she must have just gone through a breakup or something. Yeah. Or like there's a, she got an argument with a cousin or something because Absolutely. Yeah. Or the pandemic. Like Or the you pandemic. Don't have, yeah. You was don't that when you did that's, that's when you did the candles? Yeah. That's what yeah. it was. Yeah. It was, you know, I could put something to work instead of sitting here and and you know, who's right, who's wrong, who's got it right? Who's the is this the you know, like oh, my they yeah. pinned and divided everybody against each other. It was like he said, she said thing. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to do something and feel good about myself. Yeah. So powering through and doing things, definitely. And the fact that, like, my dad looks like a little cupcake. Yeah. 
five foot six, five I foot know, five. Such a tiny little pocket. You know, me, little thing him, versus yeah, right. Yeah. I'm the tallest in my family, and yeah. then my mom. I have no brothers, no sisters, and the fact that my dad, being the guy that's not the typical, you know, my let's chief, hunt, no. let's do this, yeah. let's do that. No, he is a pharmacist, you know, and the fact that he was able to pull through when the time called for it gave me that sense of like. You don't have to look the part. You don't have to just yeah. just do. Just do. In time of fear, in time of adversity, you shouldn't be building up the courage to do. No, yeah. do first. The courage will come afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Then it'd be like, pandemic. I've been through some other yeah. things. <laughs> You're like, oh, we got to stay in the right? house. Okay, yeah. I'll see you. Oh, I'll see you was... in two years. <laughs> Oh, there was a shooting somewhere, you know, not uh, belittling any school shooting stuff, but like right. outside, oh, okay, oh, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Like, you know, it's not like those <gasps> panics that you I don't know if I'm, you know, want to ever be in public again, kind of, you know, that reaction yeah. is out where it's like, well, everything could happen anywhere at any time to anybody. The, yeah. mo the main thing is handle what needs to be handled. Don't overthink the situation. Yeah. Don't get into your head and panic about things. Just do and then be like, now, like, man, I really did. Like, that was a crazy story. Yeah. But in the middle of it, it wasn't clicking You're surviving. in that sense. You're, yeah. yeah, it's just you part just, of it. Exactly. Yeah. So that's what I got from my parents where it's like, none of them are that type where it's, you know, but they pulled through. Yeah. While the, my other uncles and whatever that are the type, that are all macho and stuff, they were too scared to even get out of from Kuwait. Yeah. Oh, they stayed, but they're the hunters. They're the gun lovers, and this and, and they that. Stayed. And here's my little dad is like, we're getting this. out. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah, and he wasn't like, oh, we're too scared to hit the road by ourselves. She, he was like, he took a decision. He's rarely a t risk taker. My dad's not a yeah. risk taker. Yeah. So I also learned that having always a backup plan, even if you don't have that plan laid out. Yeah. But at least he had those guys. Yeah, it's interesting. There's a lot of people, especially doing entertainment and stuff, that are like, you, if you really love it, you cannot have a backup plan. And I think it depends on your personality. True. Because I used to not have a backup plan. And then the second pandemic happened and I had one, that's when stuff started happening for me. There you go. And Absolutely. so I'm like, it depends. There's some, like, if people are the type of personality that are always going to fall back on stuff, then yeah, you should not have one. No. But for me, I'm like, well, it's either I keep going or this is what my thing is. Uh, I'm going to work harder for that. Exactly. You know what I mean? It just depends how you Absolutely. perceive a backup but plan. Also, yeah. whether candles or not, I didn't have that plan. Yeah. But to me, I've always dealt with live events and theater and all that. And then with the pandemic, because you can have depression, you can have whatever you want. And not f personal, like overall economic depressions yeah. and whatnot. But live events, entertainment's always going to be even more so because people want to laugh. People want to go out, have a good time, forget some of that, right? Yeah. So, but, but with the pandemic, it was like, oh, everything else can open up, but live events... How are you going to get all these people next to each other with in a, a contagious situation? Yeah. You know, so it never clicked in my head. It was like, oh, wow, I'm in an industry that could actually have a shutdown. Yeah. And wouldn't know how to open. Yeah. And so that's where I was like, mm, and let me start something somewhere. Keep myself, you know, busy. At least learn Did the process. I, I, and I have to share this. I would see Nanor, because um, at that point you're just watching social media, right? <laughs> yeah. And she was in, was it your garage? My or garage. Your, in a garage. <laughs> and she had these beautiful boxes, like the marketing. First of all, your background's marketing, right? Yeah. Uh, well, operations management, logistics, but I've done marketing for a I long time. I mean, your marketing is yeah, on point marketing because for a long time. the candles themselves, everything is so, and I was like, what is she doing? And I would texted you and we hadn't talked in a while because <laughs> of the pandemic. And I was like, hey, what are you up to? Like your energy in this. And you're like, you're on a medicine ball taking close up mm. pictures of the products. And I was like, your energy looked <laughs> so focused and driven when everybody else was like, hey guys, this is me making sourdough. And I'm like, she's creating an entire fucking company and we're making sourdough. And I was like, I want some of that fucking energy. So I was like, hey, uh, yeah, you wanna you go on a me. walk? Let's yeah, go on a right? walk. And then You're we went on it, dude. And it's, it's, and it's also like high quality stuff. And like, you would just tell me, you're like, I just found this thing and I, I don't want to skimp on product stuff and I feel like I'm pitching your product oh. that's what it sounds like but but my thing was like man she has thought of every aspect of this and I'm just trying to survive at home with a baby during the pandemic hey you know that's no joke you, though. but you look like you, you know? were like next level thriving and oh. it's you know when you see stories on Instagram and yeah. you're just scrolling 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 there was just something that I was like what's she doing today 
What is she doing today? I love it. Yeah, yeah it's great. So it was, yeah, you got to just power, like power through and find that, that thing. So to me, I think that's definitely, res and I never really thought about it until like I had to think about this. Yeah. Where I was like, wow, that that is what I actually do. Whenever things go rough, I put myself power to through. work. And we almost also always need it though, too. Because I know me, like if you tell me, oh, yeah. I asked Craig, I was, we were taping the comedy special and I go, Craig, we were backstage with Everly and I was like, hey, uh, this is my daughter's dad. And I go, can you give me a pep talk real quick? And he's like, yeah. I was like, I'm not in it. I'm not in my body. I'm not in my, and he's yeah. like, two things. One, nobody knows what your script is. So you could literally go up there and say anything. No, and you're naturally funny. So it's fine. I was like, okay, cool, cool. <laughs> and then, uh, which is like something everybody would say. And then he goes, also, you're really good when you're competitive. And I was like, I don't. I don't think that's the word you want. I know what you're trying to say. And he goes, okay, what if I told you um, there are way funnier people out there and you're never going to match up? And I was like, fuck off. And he goes, yeah, because you have to get pissed off <laughs> to do a great job. Yeah. So you have to almost have the cards stacked against you mm -hmm. for you to be like, fuck this. Oh, absolutely. But, but oh. then I'm also like, if the cards aren't stacked against me, I'm like, oh, I'll do a mediocre job. <laughs> so I need the hundred percent. I need somebody to be like, you suck. Oh. And I'll be like, oh, let's fight. Yeah. You know? If you ever want me to do something, just tell me I can't do it. <laughs> yeah. I'll do it to the T and yeah. throw it right into your face. Yeah. Even if I didn't want to do even it. Even if I didn't want to do it. <laughs> even if it was something I had no desire to do. Absolutely. I wish somebody would have been like, you'll never be a millionaire. That's yeah, it. Right? I would have been a millionaire already. That's all it would have taken. I would have made it too. No. God. <laughs> And uh, yeah, uh, that, that ultimately what it goes down to, my medicine being just throwing myself and lately having, you know, going through certain emotions in my head over other things, I've realized, oh yeah, 14 hours at, at work is cool. We're good. Yeah. It's uh, my coping, my therapy, my coping yeah. mechanism because it is somewhere that I feel confident about my work. It is somewhere that, so it, I, it's my way of compensating for other things, whether it's a distraction or escape or something. But it actually, in time, makes me the lo you know the level of achievement, accomplishment, and confidence that I get through the, my work. Let's say throwing myself to work compensates and makes me feel. I don't go back and you know think about the adversity stuff or yeah. the sadness you of things. You don't sit in it. You it's don't like, sit in it. Yeah. What's the look point? what I did. What am I sad about? Yeah. You know, or I guess call it ego, call it this, but it's a healthy ego boost. Is I mean. A certain dose of ego boost is very healthy to keep you motivated and keep right. going. Right. So yeah, it's it's you gotta. There was there was something. I think there's a whole new age thing, and I buy into a lot of it. Where it's like you don't want to overwork yourself. You don't want to like, uh, you know, you don't you don't want to overwork and do what our parents did. You don't want to like mm -hmm. bleed yourself dry and then not have any time. But then I saw something interesting on uh, one of the socials, and this guy goes. Look, I get that that's what works for a lot of people. Uh -huh. And I understand that you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to spend 60 hours a week and then ignore your family. That's not, he goes, that's not what I'm doing. He goes, but I love working 12 hour days. I love doing it six days a week. Mm -hmm. So if you tell me that I'm burning the candle at both ends, I'm like, but I'm doing it, doing yeah. something I love. Yes. He's like, I'm not a singer. I'm not an entertainer. But if an entertainer did it, you guys would be like, oh, well, they're doing something that they love. Yeah, and he goes, this is how you become a legend. You spend 12 hours a day in a recording studio. And or then, it, then yeah. it's fine. Yeah. And he goes, but if I'm in an office doing it, people are like, you are, you need to reprioritize. And he goes, but this is what I love to do. Yeah. So back off. So there are a lot of people mm -hmm. that just love to work. Absolutely. And that's, you know, I mean, I'd prefer to be inherently wealthy, but yeah, but I also love to work. Yeah, I love, I, I always love finding stuff to do and keeping busy. Absolutely. Cause it's, it's a mental exercise. It's, it's a, you overcome challenges of the day and, uh, and you're being, less likely to think about like, uh, some dude who didn't call you back on Tinder or oh, something, you know what yeah. I mean? Like you're not going to think yeah. about it cause you're like, I've got six <laughs> gigs lined up and exactly. you only focus on that stuff. If you have time to sit and just kind of like, yeah, sit know, and wonder and the devil's playground. Yeah, totally. And yeah, at the, at the end of the day, even like when I go to work, the line of work that I have is every day I could be doing, I've been doing it for 20 years, but at the end of the day, every time I have a show, it's a new set of challenges yeah. that I need to take care of. So I've become, because I throw myself Tell them what things, you do so that they know what um, you do. I, uh, I manage a venue, uh, a, a 600 seat theater performing arts center. Um, and, and it's, it's just a lot of fun. I used to basically the groundlings, groundlings yeah. before that was the Greek theater. And, uh, but this one's definitely the solo, like 
this raising the you. stakes to another yeah. level. Yeah. So I book it. I manage the, you know, what their needs are, the tech and uh, with ticketing, customer service. You do everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so every day you come into the office, there's a whole new set of you know, problem solving. Fire so you've got to be yeah. on your feet. You can't yeah. be like, well, we planned it this way, this way, this way. Yeah, but the day of the show. This happened. I'm going to need somebody to oh, that cable didn't work. Da, 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 you know, so you got to be yeah. on your feet. So it really does take me out of my head. And I love that I did that. Yeah. Didn't matter. The stupid rod from the theater curtain thing is not coming down because the panel's acting up. Yeah. No, I'm stubborn enough to go in there and figure it out yeah. and actually did it. Yeah. And the moment that little curtain was high up this much because we were painting the stage, came down and I was like, yes. Yeah. You You're know? like, that's victory. I'm yeah. Like, Nothing can yeah. ruin my day now. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So the little wins. You have purpose. It, you have a, like, but you also have a higher sense of purpose too. Absolutely. And I don't have the baby. I don't have the family. So I'm not going to, I'll try to pursue to whatever extent, but we all know the avenues that lead to the, in the dating world. Yeah. But I'd rather like be in that environment where everybody's coming to me and now I'm making a name for myself and yeah, my community. And it's purpose. And yeah. If anybody needs me, they can come and find me rather yeah. than me going out pursuing and, and wasting time. Because that's what we do in the dating world in LA. We're the ones who have to pursue and yeah. find stuff. And it's like, difficult. no, yeah. it's, it's, it is what it is. And, um, uh, if I don't have any other obligations, so what if I throw myself to work? Big deal. You yeah. know? Yeah. The, people love telling people what to do all the time, right? It's like, no, you shouldn't do that. It's like, okay, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Focus on you. Okay. I'm going to ask one question. So after escaping Kuwait during the Gulf War, what is the funniest lesson that you've learned? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> um, I really love action movies. <laughs> I can't like it. It's you're just, like into like John Wick and stuff. After oh. that, I'd be like, no, I just want to watch Hallmark Christmas movies. And you're like, give me John Wick with a bazooka. Yes, give me Stallone and Commando and blowing yeah, shit up. That's great. It's yeah. I just don't have that like resent. It's like oh no, coming back violent triggers and what? No, it's like give me. It's like facing facing. You're facing the whole thing. it. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. It's okay. facing it. It's like oh man. And then I watch it though. It's weird. And consciously slash subconsciously, maybe, I don't know. But when I'm watching it, I'm learning. Yeah. So it's not just an entertainment thing. It's like, oh, shit, if this happens, I can do this. I can do that. Or da -da -da. Like, it's registering stuff. Yeah. In the brain. <laughs> you're seeing it on a different level. I'm like, this seeing is entertaining. And you're like, okay, I'm going to yeah. build a basement. I'm going to fill with, like, <laughs> ammo ready to go. In 1998, my parents left to Syria, go, went back for the first time after we had moved out. And what turned, my grandma was sick, and what turned out to be one month trip, three months, 18 year or 19 and a half at the time, for the first time by myself in the house. I was like, okay. Um, there was knives and weaponry, not everywhere. guns. Everywhere. Everywhere, the most ridiculous places, <laughs> places you could think of between the mattress and the You'd be the, the worst box. house it to was... walk into by accident, man. You'd be the worst house. <laughs> I had the big, huge, you know, cutting knife yeah. under the pillow the next to The butcher to... block. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. I was like, one wrong the move. I could knife. stab myself <laughs> sleeping. <laughs> but you were ready. You were ready for but Armageddon, ready. dude. But no, definitely the, the funniest thing is definitely me being so obsessed over action. Yeah. I love it. Um, you can call it cheesy action or whatever. I take it all. It's just so fun to be, to have experienced that and on top of it, you know. And, and also from Syria, I, well, in Syria, I went to a boot camp of 13 days straight, yeah. no shower, no cosmetics of any kind, no deodorants, no nothing, straight boot camp. Like, there were scorpions <laughs> running around uh -uh. in the tents where you're sleeping. There's no sleeping bag, just one, like, layer of something. So you get the rock underneath, yeah. you're done. In the middle of the night, they'll stage, like, a fake attack on you. We'll go on what? a hike. This bottle of water for 20 people on a hike on a hot uh, summer, almost, like, half of the everybody was like passing out and stuff. It's like to teach you rough and toughen it in yeah. survival in the mountains. This is like in the mountains. I remember I, I, for a good 20 minutes I was walking like, and, and you're on a, 
like you can slip off into yeah. the, you know, down the ravine. I remember just like blacking in and out, in and out. And then I, like, it's torture. The things you're eating is torture. Everything was like torture. Yeah, yeah, and then, oh, extracurricular activity time. What do you want to do? My ass, karate. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, reading books, doing literary stuff. And, and I'm like, like nah, let's yep, go. sign let's me go. up. And so that, and then I learned to, you know, I had had enough at one point. I was so like, it was my first experience, anything crazy like that. At thir that I was 13. That's insane, and it's, dude. And then. I was mad Kent Carstens wouldn't kiss me. <laughs> like, what is happening? I didn't even know anything about kissing and none of that <laughs> shit. Nothing like that. Kuwait would censor all of that out. Even like Little Mermaid kissing the prince. It's like. What? Censored out. Yeah. Uh, so I, but I enjoyed my childhood. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, cool. Yeah. It was cool. Yeah. But I learned at that boot camp thing, I went up to the leader thing and I, the uh, leader guy, and I started negotiating with him. I negotiated. That was the first time I've learned like survival skills yeah. and the way you want something to get something, you got to negotiate. Was the, what was the negotiation? Cleaning the outhouse in exchange for a shower. Look at you. I did it. In exchange for what? Again, I feel like we have such similar stories from our childhood. What? <laughs> and they agreed. I was like, yes. My cousin in the same camp, he didn't, he like sneaked away and took a shower. He covered him in jam, left him in the middle of the square. No. Ants. F ants, bees. Fire ants. Anything you uh. could possibly think of coming out. I, was, I go... I go up to the guy again. I go, um, hey, uh, that's my cousin down there. <laughs> he goes, yeah, I know. I go, do you know who our uncle is? I pulled, st I, I yeah. name dropped like name a motherfucker. Up. Yeah, <laughs> I would too in that situation. He goes, who? I go, you know, I, get, I said the name. And my uncle's the one who completely had, it was his thing, this whole survival Survivalist. boot camp. Yeah. He's the one who established that. Yeah. He's got like, they call him Amigo. He's the head of it, yeah. And I go, Amigo is our, is our uncle. What? I was like, yeah, I suggest you let go. Yeah. yeah. Let him go. He's yeah. going to go take a shower and he's going to join us. You've been torturing him every day and this is where I draw the line. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like off the first get go I went and, you know, yeah. but it taught me that like. Building you relationships. Can always, exactly. Negotiate. Yeah. You can negotiate. You can talk to someone, but push Dude, comes to shove. Handle. You got to, you got to hand, like you got to show some teeth. Yeah. Even if I'm going to pull in strings on name dropping my uncle. Nah, because what you're doing is not. You know, like, I'm yeah. not just dropping a name for no reason. You've been right. torturing him other ways, but now it's, like, drawing the line. Right. You know, so if bees, ants, God knows what could happen to the guy. You know, you can't be jam putting yeah. jam in the, under the sun, like, leaving him brought. No. But it taught and me jam, that little, dude. you know, that, that that's another, like, the funny thing is I learned how yeah. to also negotiate, talk. There's always a common ground that you can come up to. Um, you know, if you lose, uh, if you use that logic and, and you know that understanding, they want something too. Yeah, I can, I, I can find out what they yeah. want. You know, yeah, not in necessarily manipulation, so to speak, but, but communication. Communication, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like I need to survive in this situation. Dude. Things are need to happen. I feel like you could survive in any situation, dude. Oh, I think the, like the, the pandemic for everybody else was like, oh god, for you were like, oh, I just Finally got to start my break. own business. <laughs> I just needed time away to start my own business. Like, what the fuck? Finally, I get to sleep however long I want. <laughs> the nappy uh, times. I think that's a good spot to end, yeah? Huh? I think that's a good spot to end, yeah? Sure. Dude, I'm so excited <laughs> that you came on. That was crazy. Yeah, thanks for having me. I heard, like, maybe bits and pieces of that, but not all of it. That's crazy, man. Yeah. You it's... can survive anything. Thank and I you. definitely don't want to piss you off, which I'm glad I have not in 14 years. That's great. Or 10 years. If you haven't thus far, you're not going to. I know, right? <laughs> I would never. I would never. Um, all right, guys. Uh, thank you so much for being on. Thank you for having me. If you guys like this episode, don't forget to uh, follow me on at the funny thing is podcast on all my socials or NicoleComedy.com. And as always, like, follow and subscribe. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>